So welcome everybody. This is our Food for Thought discussion series. Um, and this uh, month we're going to be talking about design for social interaction. And I'm going to hand it to our host, Jonathan. Great. Um, so again, the topic is design for social interaction. It's based on an article called our brains sculpt each other, and that was in um, Science News, uh, in, I think back in April. Um, and it's based on the work of uh, Thalia Wheatley, and she's a social neuroscientist. She's also faculty at Dartmouth um, College, and she's really um, studying this kind of phenomenon that um, really defines what makes us human, which is our ability to interact socially, and really how um, formative that is in our own uh, identities and how we relate to the world. And it actually has um, uh, influence on our brain function. And she's interested in really studying that because um, kind of the way up, up till now, neuroscience is largely based on this, what they call brain in a jar kind of um, way of thinking about um, brain function, and, and that means we're studying brains in isolation. We're studying individuals and, and how um, their brains function. For instance, um, and this was in the article, MRI machines that do brain scans are really built for one person, right? So she's um, doing experiments where she's built a device or she's had people um, construct kind of a cushioned helmet that allows um, people in distributed locations. So I think they're doing it in Harvard and Dartmouth. Um, so you can study what happens to the brain when two people are interacting with each other. So that's really kind of the, the ideas that the article um, kind of summarized. So key ideas, um, deprived of social interaction, our brains stop working well. Uh, we lose actually our sense of ourselves, and I'll explain more about that later. Um, you know, we, we need to change the way we study um, neuroscience, and that'll dovetail into our discussion about design and how we, um, how we design for people. Um, and then there's this concept of the super brain. So mind-to-mind -mind interactions create more than the sum of its parts, right? Um, and uh, we want to take a more holistic look at brain function in the future. Well, I want to start by talking about this poor fellow, um, Phineas P. Gage. He was a, um, a foreman on a train uh, construction site back in 1848. Um, and he was distracted while he was working. And um, what, he was, what they were doing, it was a demolition crew and they were um, kind of uh, tapping dynamite with these hammers, and it involved um, those ominous iron rods. And what ended up happening is um, he accidentally sparked um, the hammer, and his head was um, focused um, on the people that were distracting him, and his mouth was open, and that iron rod shot through into his mouth and destroyed most of his frontal lobe of his brain. Now, that sounds completely devastating, right? And it was for a while, but he didn't die. And um, uh, although um, after the accident, people said that he, he, um, you know, he stopped being engaged. He, he was unrecognizable as his former self, just his personality. Um, but uh, years later, he got a job as a, a stagecoach driver in Chile. And he started interacting with people um, on a daily basis. He had more of a structure. And those daily interactions helped him build back his identity and really uh, gave him back his social skills. And he began to, to be more of a person again. And so um, they, neuroscientists kind of use this story as an example to show the importance of social interactions um, for our health and for our sanity. So. Um, you know, um, luckily he, he got back his life in the end. So um, again, and we talked about Thalia Wheatley, she's the, um, the person on which that science news article is based. She's really concerned with social interactions. She calls herself a social neuroscientist. Um, so on that note, and bringing it back to design, um, 
my first topic for you guys is what role do you think um, the social neuroscience plays in our design research? Does anyone want to start? It's interesting because a lot of the sessions that we plan when we do user research are usually focused on one participant. And I feel like we consciously do that because there's a lot of um, science even, probably, <laughs> about how groupthink is an issue. We tend to avoid focus groups because we think sometimes information gets clouded. Um, so it does make me wonder if we should be rethinking how we approach our design research. Yeah, and if, how many jobs um, that we study and observe are done in isolation? Like, a lot of the interaction and engagement of customers' brands and experiences are done socially or collaboratively, right? So it also doesn't even feel true to the natural behavior um, that we're trying to observe. Right? I do feel like it actually validates our reasoning and rationale because I think just employing someone in isolation and interviewing them, the point is to like we're not trying to necessarily, if we're doing an observational study, by all means, we should study their interactions. Um, but because people are so intertwined, um, you might be getting opinions of other people even through their feedback because their experience is never their own. And so it's just to give them a clear voice and respect them, I think. And um, I feel like it's not necessarily a bad thing because their life experience is still kind of a shared collective experience. That's a really cool idea. It's like they already have the embedded social interaction that we need to observe and they're just the, the vessel um, that we're um, to express it in our research. So that's a good point. Anyone else? Well, the, the point, I feel like there was a point made about everyone being, you know, kind of the point Caitlin just made. We're all kind of like a mix of different biases and different experiences and different histories. And so I think that is true that we get kind of these different semi-individual, semi-socially related takes on whatever interview research we're doing. But I was thinking then it kind of presented, you know, to the point of the uber, uber mind, which I thought was an interesting title. Um, that maybe it doesn't necessarily need to be considered as like there is the, the, the single part and some of the parts. I thought the article was trying to present it as like there is the single person, then there's like this other thing which is more like a super organism, you know, hive mind that's not necessarily representative of everything being squished together, but then has like its own different separate output. And I just wondered maybe they should be considered as like when you do an interview or a series of interviews, if there's like, you know you're gonna interview five plus people, maybe like there's also a group thing at the end where there's five people brought together mm -hmm. and that's considered as almost like an equal but slightly separate uh, entry in that same part of research. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like that's kind of why we have different um, things at different phases in time. So we have usually a kickoff workshop with certain people involved yeah. where we want that collective mindset. Right. Um, and that helps kind of spark the general like concepts and ideas that will drive the project. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the difference is though, because I wrote that down, because I was thinking about like, when do we have groups? And I was thinking like workshops. But the people that we speak to in the workshop are not necessarily, or usually aren't the people that we speak to in like interviews in some, in some aspects. I also feel like a workshop setting is like inherently different a lot of times so than when we do like interviews. I mean, obviously this is all kind of like hypothetical. Um, so I feel like, because the, the workshop does have outputs that, yeah, definitely form and shape what we do a lot of the time. I wonder whether that's why, in a way, maybe doing like a separate group interview that is part of, you know, specifically contextual to whatever this interview research is we're doing and considering it then alongside the individuals. Because I suppose with individual user research and interviews, we're, we're kind of looking for like idiosyncrasies and things that people pull out that we may not notice. But there's also like a definite, a definite like averaging going on in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, like we, there's like law of diminishing returns of doing five plus, sure. right? And the point of that is because at a certain point, it's just adding to like a kind of commonality that we see or whatever. Um, 
but that's where I wonder maybe a group interview or some format of like group research interview thing could be useful or interesting as like an equal but separate entry into that. I don't know. I don't know how it come out. Fascinating. <laughs> um, I also think that kind of group research makes the most sense if you're designing an experience that's really meant to be shared. Yeah. yeah. There's right. so many times where designing experiences right now that are actually <coughs> intended to be used individually, yeah. mm -hmm. um, which kind of poses a new question, like, in the future, is the future of experiences that they should be created more to be shared. And right. mm -hmm. when I think about immersive experiences, or, you know, in VR, AR, where, you know, we expect people to be looking at the same thing more often, interacting together, that's where I almost feel like testing those experiences it, with groups to see how, what mm -hmm. are the interactions, how is the interplay, um, that could create almost a whole new set of research. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes me wonder if it's really relevant when we are creating things that are more individual or if it's just for those shared experiences. Yeah, I mean, I think it'd be pretty tough to like define what is like an individual experience. Oh, it'll be interesting to try and do that. Because mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of things that, to a point, I'm not sure who made the point, um, but you know, a lot of things that we do individually, we kind of do almost as if we're not being watched, because that sounds kind of really, really weird and maybe that's just my paranoia. But like if you're on like social media, you know, there's like, uh, in, like like Instagram, you're kind of just doing just your response to things, but it's like your response in the context of like everyone else who sees those things. I guess no one would say that's an individual experience. I don't know. It'd be interesting to try and figure out what is an individual right. experience. On our project now, I think it's kind of interesting because when you think of a medical scenario where you have potentially a doctor who's documenting things on a screen... Um, and then a patient still in the room. It like this whole idea. It just got me staring at all of our screens in our <laughs> office and being like, "Wow, we just have our own personal little isolated thing here, and we get absorbed in that." But it is interesting thinking about how a doctor has to not only take down the information but interact with the patient at the same time, and how does that change how they would do that versus just being in a room by themselves. All right, I'm going to uh, switch to a new discussion topic. It'll be related. Um, so how does our understanding of the importance of these social interactions influence what we actually design? Um, not the research to inform it, but the actual products and services we're designing. I think this touches on where you were going with your point. Yeah, I do, I do think so often our experiences are tailored to an individual experience. Um, when maybe now that we have these new medium that are available to us, it could be designed in a way that's more social. Um, people aren't, don't feel as isolated. Yeah, we call these personal computers, but maybe um, there's more of a social computing device mm -hmm. in the future. Um, mm -hmm. Any other thoughts about that? Yeah, when you work on the UC for Gen we actually do utilization groups, not mm -hmm. for individuals, because uh, they have very special conditions where they have a uh, specialists in the biohazard suits, and they work in the pair. Mm -hmm. So one work with the mice, and second work with the uh, like entering data, some update. And so we actually record uh, uh, videos about how they communicate uh, because they are work uh, in a very fast pace. Mm -hmm. So their work is very efficient uh, in, in pair, and we need to understand what can be optimized there and how we can uh, improve. Yeah. I mean, uh, these more screens, things. right? Um, sorry. These <laughs> screens are kind of built for one, right? They're mm -hmm. laptops. They yeah. sit on one person's lap. And, like, you know, we have to think of screen-based and non-screen-based experiences in the future mm -hmm. and how they become rooms and environments and in inclusive of more than one person. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think the whole IoT mm -hmm. space is really interesting. Like, you think of Alexa, and that's totally a shared experience. Like, it's playing music for you, for your family, giving you an update that everyone can hear. Um, and then I, my mind went to Blade Runner and like the hologram woman and you know, what, what does that look like when somehow information can just be kind of floating around us in the real world, not just in a virtual world, but kind of a shared, I don't know, that's where I really get excited by augmented reality. Cool. <laughs> um, yeah, and then maybe we have to study behavior with people and people and people and non-people like robots and <laughs> avatars and 
you know, virtualized intelligence kind of thing. So, cool. All right. Next topic, um, how do we measure social inter interactions in a way that improves our understanding of individual consumers? So, meaning, um, you know, we still have to care for individual people, right? And how do the collective, their collective interactions, how do we measure that in such a way and then apply those insights to experiences for individuals? Um, it's a little convoluted, so, um, <laughs> take some time to think it through, um, or it may be a terrible question. And so do you have any other thoughts on this topic? I think what I was trying to, to get from this is like, um, we know people engage together, yet our analytics are really geared towards individual interactions. Some are collective aggregate, but how do we take those aggregate metrics and apply them to individual experiences? I think there is a, a, another angle on these topics uh, where we need to create a chatbot mm -hmm. or interactive experience when individuals talk or work with a robot or like automated response. Yeah. It's, for me, it's, it's still social interaction because, and we need to understand what kind of uh, questions mm -hmm. that individual will have for the for the system, or how will he will work with the systems. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else have anything to add to the topic? If not, we, we can probably uh, conclude. I'm not sure. I couldn't think of anything. I don't understand the question completely. We'll end it then. <laughs> well, yeah, I, just uh, what this sparked for me yeah. is. Um, what does success look like for social interactions? Mm -hmm. I, it's kind of related to measuring, but it's like, I just feel like when you're in a group setting, it, you could start to have goals of like, is, is the goal that these people are getting along when they're in the space? Is right. the goal that they're working the most efficiently? Um, I think it just introduces like a whole new set of thinking through what's the goal of your experience or interaction. Are they trying to have fun together? Yeah. Um, so let me rephrase, because that's perfect. So okay. it's like, how do we measure shared experiences then? Mm -hmm. To simplify it, like um, when we're so, like we're, we measure um, group, I guess, um, group aggregate metrics for populations acting individually, right? So when we look at, um, let's say some analytics for a certain geography, like census data or whatever. It's, um, it, it is a population, but it's individual uh, measurement, right? So are there any measures that you can think of for let's say a virtual meeting where we can understand if we've designed it effectively for the people having that shared experience? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what Alex said? You know, like, yeah. is there a common goal versus individual goal? Mm -hmm. And how, like, what's the ratio of those things being met? If the group feels like they achieved something versus, you know, yeah. a minority feel like actually I didn't achieve what I came in here to achieve. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting to compare, maybe. I think, oh, okay. <laughs> well, just the idea of metrics of being applied to social things. I mean, it's, it, I think I think to a certain degree, we always have to kind of quantify things in our minds to try to justify them because we're rational beings. But you, the example you gave of Phineas, I feel like he was probably an exception. Here's a guy who survived this crazy thing and exceeded expectations about his brain capacity um, because there was something that we, we weren't able to quantify or measure until that point in time. And I, I loved the way you had started to describe the idea of like, we're looking at a collective, but there's always still the individual. And I feel like this goes all the way back to the, to the beginning mindset of why we interview, we could interview in both groups and an individual because there's always um, a different perspective. And that's why I think to your point of that, like, collective mind is a different thing from an individual mind. It's not just an individual in the collective. Right. right, and the article argued that like you, that a group will come up with, you know, a much like better idea because it's more, you have more kind of diverse approaches and different ways of thinking about things. So if there was a whole like measuring part to, the, to doing this, 
maybe it could be playing back, you know, like individual ideas with one hand against like a group idea at the end. But I would argue that Thalia Wheatley says there are no individual ideas. Because well, we're, that's the perfect way to test it. <laughs> we have embedded groups in our heads, is what she's trying. But to like say. my embedded group and your embedded group versus the actual <laughs> that's group, true. yeah, might be totally different. You're the lens for that embedded right. group, right? I think that, I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Although it does feel like almost competitive in a way, then, which I think might detract from the experience. You were to take it from purely a like biological standpoint and mm -hmm. actually not a mind standpoint. And just think about like collective averages about the human body and how it works versus anomalies. Mm -hmm. I think it breaks that. And so I think it's fair to say our mind could always do that as well. Mm -hmm. Like there's always going to be kind of exceptions to the average um, that may even shift how we define an average. I think we should. So, <laughs> yeah. From, <laughs> my, from my standpoint, it's more like the technical approach mm -hmm. I'm taking here. Like, when we have a when we design uh, traditional interfaces, we have uh, very straightforward uh, KPIs like how many clicks uh, users should take to get to that specific function, or uh, like uh, for most important functions, it should be like one or two clicks. For the uh, not so important functions, maybe multiple clicks. Mm -hmm. Or how data is presented in in which way if client could understand the data from one screen, or he need to dig. Uh, through the multiple screens. I think that paradigm could be applied here. It's about the social interaction. So how many steps should I take to explain my ideas to my colleagues in uh, shared experience? For example, if I have a model in front of me, I want to point on like an imperfection there, or if I want to uh, say that this needs to be improved, or this needs to be changed, this color should be uh, replaced or something. So it's that type of technical uh, approach we could uh, create a like TPI for that shared experience. Cool. Because I think, you know, go ahead. Yes, yeah, because we cannot get into the mind of the people. It's, we have a well, objective measurements and uh, subjective measurement. Well, I mean, there's qualitative measurement and yeah. quantitative measurement. You're talking about quantitative measurement. Yeah. When I'm talking about how do we understand the quality of that social interaction in a group setting. So, with a shared experience. Yeah, I just think that if I can explain my thoughts in a um, mm -hmm. straight way, yeah. uh, that, that also delivers a high quality of the shared experience. I just find it interesting that when we have focus groups, a lot of the um, criticism about them is that they're biased because they include more than one perspective. When most of our you know, engagement as humans are with other people and, and influenced by other perspectives. So um, it's an interesting thing to think about. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe though, if you look at both like from an individual perspective on a one-on-one -on -one basis and maybe doing an interview with someone and then combine that with, I don't know if it's like a focus group, but some sort of group research method, you might be able to kind of read between the lines and right. be able to like validate certain patterns and hypotheses that you might have um, to like come up with new information. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, the more data points you have, the more you're going to be able to get out of that. So I think if we can combine both the individual and group methods in some way to, you know, um, see where there's overlap, mm -hmm. see where there are differences, we might get richer insights out of that. Sounds like a good approach. Yeah, I also think it's interesting because the individual versus focus group paradigm is more like when we're doing interviews or exploratory research. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the potential for the social group research, I see mostly on like actually testing the experience. Mm -hmm. So like mm -hmm. um, people are actually using it and interacting and you're studying how it's working and measuring the success of it. Is that um, too late, though, after you've designed it? I yeah. guess, yeah, that's an interesting question. If you're designing the social experience, does it make sense to talk to people in a social setting? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that's where, like, an observational study mm -hmm. prior to testing makes a ton of sense. Like, mm -hmm. you could go in their environment in the current state and still observe those interactions. Right. Like, how are they working together now? Let's study it. And then with this new experience, how does that Yeah, yeah. the goal of behavioral research is to observe it as close to as 
as it happens, mm -hmm. like um, in context. So if it's a group social engagement, we should observe that as, you know, if we're designing for that situation, right? Yeah. So. And actually, I do think now we tend to prioritize the like interview style um, mm -hmm. research when we're doing exploratory research, but maybe if we are designing for a social interaction, we would be prioritizing, like, let me just study you guys. Yeah, we're yeah true. And to like, yeah. kind of to the point that Mikhail was making, for an example of a collaborative, like, workshopping setting, or like some kind of brainstorming, whiteboarding activity, like interviewing each person by it, you might find certain things, but I suppose just watching and observing, you might come up with a thing mm -hmm. like, actually, it'd be really useful there seems to be a lot of people where one person will lead the group and actually others will kind of wait to chip in if there's a way that people could kind of cumulatively come up with their own ideas and then be able to, I don't know, things always get lost, don't they, when you're doing like whiteboarding or I always feel like they do. Yeah. Where you're kind of like, oh, oh, I'll just hold on. I've got an idea, but I'm going to wait. And then you're like, ah, it was rubbish. And so maybe there is like a good observational point to it. I think it just needs to be put into a context because it's hard mm -hmm. to talk about measuring social interactions like... What are this? What what are these types of things we're measuring? I think the idea. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say I was thinking about workshopping as well, and I think that you know, in a lot of these workshops that we do with clients, there's a lot that we can sort of like glean from the interpersonal dynamic that's going on sure. within those organizations. Some of the like you know political struggles that may exist, yeah. which um, is kind of like observational research and can tell us a lot. So. I guess it's like we're in that um, observation mode all the time, even when we're not like with our research hat on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do feel like there's a huge power to observational research that we don't necessarily always take advantage of that helps us learn things maybe even faster. You know, there's always the kind of like show me, don't tell me mindset. And I, in like urban design, a lot of um, decisions are made in like public open space about observing how people move through the space and what their like desire paths are. So um, potentially you build certain walkways just based on like the path of least resistance or what people choose to take and where they stop. Um, and so, so much of that research is without words, without anyone speaking or sharing. Um, but but it's cool because they're still interacting. I, I don't know. I try to take it back to that, but like there's still a social component to that of a group of people being in space. And should we like measure in groups as well? Because mm -hmm. I don't know whether a lot of time when we interview and do stuff like that, it's like one person's interpretation or sometimes two people's interpretation mm -hmm. and a note taker, and then you kind of combine and mix. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it would be a good idea to measure in a group. I don't know how how you'd even do that. But, because that might be really weird to have like a group of people being watched by a group of people. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that kind it's of what so we do in prioritization <laughs> exercises do you in know, a workshop? Maybe. Just think, if there was a group of people sat around us watching <laughs> us do this. Maybe they're <laughs> well, kind of that mirror, you know, where you don't see them watching you. <laughs> oh, right, okay. So, yeah, I won't yeah. yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely that thread of like people behaving differently if they know they're mm -hmm. being watched. Well, so. that's the bias argument um, for a lot of research and how we conduct it, and including the focus groups where you know people are worried that some extrovert is going to who keeps talking during the focus group is going to influence the introverts in the group, and they're just going to go along with what that person says, and that's going to bias and skew the you know, the um, thinking or the observations. Um, anyone else have any other insights on this topic? No. Thank you. So I'm following Thalia on Twitter, and I, I would like to see if she may um, yeah. have some further insights on our discussion, so I'll send her a link to this. It'll be on YouTube, Thalia, <laughs> if you're watching. So... Um, <laughs> Thanks, everyone. It's a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Social hug. <laughs>